Hello and welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. It is Friday, February 5th, and we are continuing our conversation on H101, uh, an act relating to the implementation of uh, Act 173 by providing grant funding to build systems-driven sustainable literacy support for students with uh, measurable outcomes. So the bill that we have before us um, is our, our working document and we are really interested in hearing from you. So let's start with um, Michaela Martin. And if you could introduce yourself and yeah. give a um, to me. Thanks for having me. I'm Michaela Martin. I am a co-director of school transformation in uh, um, Central Vermont Supervisory Union. And I'm here with my colleague, um, Andrea Wasson, who's also a co-director of school transformation. Um, we work um, in partnership um, to build systems um, within schools around academics and social emotional. This is my 12th year um, in this position um, with um, the Central Vermont was recently merged a merged school district with um, the Orange North and Washington South. Um, so we are th um, the third year into our merger. Great. And I would just add that um, our job titles alone, I think tell a little bit of the story um, from uh, what was Orange North and now uh, the merged Central Vermont Supervisory Union in that Michaela, um, would be more what you would uh, consider the typical curriculum uh, director in an SU and, and my lens um, would, is more on the special services, special education side of things. Great. I'm also here um, in my capacity as um, the president elect for uh, Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. But um, uh, yeah, again, thank you for having us. And, and Michaela and I submitted um, some written uh, testimony uh, regarding um, the bill and we thought that today it might be most helpful for us to tell a little bit of the story, the story that started before I came. This is my fourth year um, in uh, CVSU and Michaela and the team started the work well before um, uh, I got here and I've been able to reap the benefits and just continue uh, to help support the efforts in particular with the merger that's required some revisiting of the practices and re-looking at what, what was done and, and what made it so effective. So I think um, probably it makes the most sense for, for Michaela to start just by, by talking a little bit about the, the history and the story and where we are, and then we can um, fill in that and um, answer any questions that you have. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so when we began the work in 2014, it was really about um, supporting our multi-tiered system of support um, for academics. So literacy was an area of need that we had. Um, and what we discovered through this process is um, there's a couple of things that we wanted to highlight that are um, critical to this our success. Um, one being it, it was part of a system. It wasn't just another initiative. So when we looked at our schools um, in 2014, they were failing schools. Um, and we, have a, we had a huge over-identification for special education um, in the area of, of reading. Um, so when we peel back the layers, what we realized is there were some key components missing. Um, we, we lack teacher expertise um, in teaching reading. Um, and we also knew that the, the major driver of any change initiative had to be the building principle. Um, and there needed to be a vision coming out of our central office um, that we were committed to. Um, so those were two key components along with building a system that was rooted in um, data and accountability. Um, so that's where we began. So um, we thought it was very critical for um, to start at our pre-K-2 level. Um, and that's where we emphasized our professional development. Um, so our professional development um, was rooted in research um, as well as the focus on foundational um, skills um, and knowledge for our classroom teachers in um, using a common approach um, for both our, our classroom universal instructions, what we call it, as well as alignment with our um, targeted intensive services so that the, the, the language was similar. Um, so when, because we had a huge silo problem between general education and special education, 
and we were investing a lot of money into one person being an interventionist um, through our title funds. So we flipped it and said, well, what if we focus um, our professional development on the classroom teacher while building their expertise for their classroom instruction, as well as making them also an interventionist. So that model of building expertise at the building level within a system rooted in collaboration um, and using data as, as a way to monitor our progress transformed our, our schools, our title funds. So, um, so that's where we wanna emphasize this idea. Like we, we applaud you for the focus on reading, um, but it, we, we, we also emphasize this idea, it has to be part of a system that everyone is invested in. Um, and we were very fortunate to have classroom teachers um, willing to take on the role of an interventionist as well as their classroom. Um, but we took a lot off their plates because we um, also created a model where they only would have to teach one or two content areas. Um, so we, while building a strong social emotional system, we also built um, an academic um, system um, really primarily investing on the universal classroom instruction because we know that if, 80, um, if we have highly effective classroom instruction um, at the universal level, then 80% of our students should be um, meeting expectations, especially at K. Yeah, so what I would um, what I would add to that it, that I think is unique about the work and the and the focus um, unique for me and my experience across um, working across a few uh, different SUs in the state is this um, as Michaela said a strong leadership team so the the central office um, with the vision and the support and building principles who all bought into the approach and and this. As Michaela said, it was larger than literacy, but if we just focus for this conversation on, on the, uh, in particular, the K-2 foundational literacy, that there was a universal curriculum, universal approach, and that in terms of equity for students, and in particular in this SU, we serve a lot of children in poverty. So, you know, creating equity for them across the schools um, where there was a, um, a common, common approach to literacy instruction that is um, you know, rooted in scientific data. And all classroom teachers are trained and they're deeply trained. Um, so, uh, and Blanche and Jana are here, so you'll hear from them later, but they are the folks that provided that training um, uh, for, for us. And then the, the deeper work that special educators or interventionists might do is also built on that same foundation. So children who are struggling are not learning something different, right, in their special education services um, from their gen ed classroom. The other um, thing that we wanted to emphasize, it wasn't in the written testimony, but um, I'm sure you're interested in, so what did that mean? What are the outcomes? And we're continuing to work on this, right? That's the other piece is that it's a never ending, right? We're always looking at, um, you know, where are we and, and what do we need to continue to do to support our teachers in our system? But I think remarkably the, over the past several years, the referrals for special education evaluations um, in particular at that you know, early uh, uh, grade level have dramatically reduced. So this in conjunction with 173 is sort of like, you know, CVSU jumped on the bandwagon before 173 and said, we really don't care about funding. We wanna put the most struggling students with the most qualified teacher to ensure, you know, that they, that they grow and we're not gonna operate under a, a wait to fail model that special education has sort of perpetuated. So um, by intervening as soon as they recognized that kids were struggling with a highly qualified teacher, um, the need for referrals to special ed have gone down dramatically. Um, I believe, uh, of course this year is a little, little tricky um, for us to, uh, to assess, but the, um, in the previous years, in one elementary school in particular, we had as few as two initial referrals for special education um, in that school. So, you know, kids' needs are being met early um, without waiting for them to fail. Um, and that's, again, the result of flexibility with service provision, data-driven decisions, monitor careful monitoring 
of student progress, understanding when kids are struggling that we might need to do some assessment to learn more about how they're processing, but that wouldn't doesn't need to go through the full special ed evaluation. Um, we saw dramatic improvement in state and local uh, testing scores for children, um, in particular at grade three, their literacy skills, dramatic, dramatic growth um, that has uh, sustained over time. And then again, as we said, a more equitable experience for, for all students. Sounds like you're describing the model that Act 173 is trying to implement related to the uh, DMG report of building the, the uh, expertise um, in the general, in the tier one programs, um, getting rid of the three nice ladies that taught reading differently to you. And um, as we used to refer to it, and uh, setting in place the leadership to make it sustainable. That's what I'm hearing. Um, as you look at our bill, the bill as it currently stands, we are looking to expand that to other areas using some of the federal funds that are flowing into the state to start to get some of these groups that aren't as far ahead with their MTSS implementation that still are using reading programs that, that really don't align with what we know about reading instruction today. Um, do you have any recommendations on the, the bill? I, I, if you had a chance to take a look at it, recommendations um, for the committee as we uh, as we continue to work on this bill. And would you agree with the idea? <laughs> um, I think we are all looking at um, multiple plans um, to support how we move forward post COVID. Um, I think that it, there's ways to, to tie it into the continuous improvement plan process or um, the COVID recovery process, because I think they're gonna, I think we're all um, initiative fatigued right now, especially around what we've experienced this year. And I think if there should be some connection to um, either the MTSS division at the agency um, so that people aren't seeing it as a one other thing we have to do or maybe apply for, I think it fits nicely, the structure with what um, how we approach continuous improvement um, through that MTSS lens, I think it's critical that those five components are, are um, part of um, the plan. That's how we approach any initiative is through the five um, components of MTSS. It doesn't go away. It's like not another thing that we do. Um, so that's, it's critical. It's, it's, it's tied to that. Um, and that, that, you know, you have flexibility around how you what approach as long as it's, you know, the evidence-based approach of it, not naming something specific. Um, because I think people have different needs um, based upon um, where they live or the, their communities itself. We chose a particular approach because that's what we felt was in the best interest of our students um, and, and the needs of our teachers. So we did a lot of analysis around what are the needs of our kids and our, and our teachers too, because the teachers were critical to the success. If they were not feeling confident in what we were providing, they were not going to go forward with it. So um, that's the other, I mean, the, our approach really has built confidence with our teachers um, and they don't feel overwhelmed. They feel like they're making a, they're having a huge impact on, on student achievement. This committee will shy away from uh, actually implementing curriculum. That's not something that's within our purview and we're quite, quite conscious of, of that. Um, would it help if the agency had uh, a list of programs that would be helpful? I think, I think the more resources for SUs from the agency would be really beneficial um, because I think, um, I don't think there's enough professional development providers within the state um, to even think about a, you know, a large scale implementation. I think that I worry about that. Um, I see, um, we used to have, um, you know, a professional development agency, an ESA LAPTA, that's now gone. Um, so I think um, we're lacking in providers for professional development, I'll be honest with you. Um, I know that if I have new teachers coming on board, I've got to get my teachers on the list early for PD because I, when we hire people, we have to train them. Um, that's just our reality. But, you know, those slots fail quickly um, because everyone has the same needs. And I think there's going to be a tremendous need coming off COVID around academic areas and social emotional. And how do we get enough vendors to help 
provide that support. That was, I think, when we reviewed the bill, and, and again, definitely applaud the, uh, the focus, the attention, and the recognition that it requires financial support in order to fulfill the recommendations of the DMG and the, um, you know, the HOPE for Act 173 that, that, that districts you know, do need some financial support. Um, there is a, a little bit of concern that this be seen again as something in isolation that's not connected to a larger um, effort and, and the recognition of just how long this change process can be and will take. And that, and that you know, the two year cycle isn't gonna be enough. Um, and um, the, I was a little concerned with the limited scope in that some districts, you know, who will jump on and benefit and others where there's still maybe not enough incentive or help um, to, so we thought, right, we've got, you know, close to a million dollars here. How could we, you know, how could that be used um, maybe from the agency level to help support all districts. You know, just some, just some wonderings around that. Um, as Michaela pointed out, I mean, teacher training is, is a critical component and teachers aren't coming out of their prep programs prepared. You know, they don't, they don't have the knowledge or the skills uh, to, to teach children how to read. And that's true for special educators as well. We have to train everybody that comes through our door. So that's, that's a huge investment. One of the, the, the parts of this is also to create the, the idea of regional groups getting together to access professional development. Um, we certainly heard from Nate Levinson of DMG. Uh, you know, he, can, he can provide it to several, do the same thing with several districts at the same time, thereby kind of creating a whole regional uh, training as opposed to just one small school district, yeah. um, which for me starts to create the idea of it's a statewide um, implementation when those teachers are moving around, right. they're moving around with, this, with the same context. Uh, yeah, no, we definitely felt like that was a, a smart uh, approach. Um, for, I mean, we try to do that as much as we can with our you know, regional partners already, but yeah, I think that's very, would you recommend that uh, there be some prioritization as to who gets the grants that the agency can select rather than maybe taking the, the one who has the, the grant writer in the district? <laughs> I, I think there has to be some kind of readiness yeah. um, for implementation. I think um, I, we'll start, the strong leadership is key and then and then how willing um, or ready are they? Or, or what do you need to do to get people ready? I think we were fortunate um, that we had a population of teachers who were eager um, to do this, this model. Um, and we had a superintendent who had a vision. And so we were supported through the whole, all the, um, through the whole thing. And I think leveraging things like your grant funding to, you know, teachers um, like their professional development funds. So because we were able to utilize our title funds to pay for this, um, it made it more attractive to, to teachers. Um, and that, you know, we were just focused on one initiative. So that was the only thing they needed to concentrate on that year when they took the training and then they had embedded coaching. We weren't asking them to focus on other things. Right. Um, so they were able to really be um, intentional about their professional development and um, were much more open to feedback um, because of that. So I think it's, it's understanding the stress of the job and then understanding what they need professionally and supporting them the whole way um, through the process. Thank you. We actually heard from Nate Levinson as well is that he said that the leadership and interest coming from, from the district is critical. Representative Brady. I think we're going to get at this a bit later in the committee today, but where is the high quality professional development on literacy coming from? I know part of the answer is certainly going to be Stern Center, but what are the other institutions, trainers, places where you are tapping into, um, particularly Vermont resources? The, the Stern Center was our professional development provider and continues to be. We also utilize um, for, especially in special education topics, some related to literacy, um, the Vermont Higher Ed Collaborative 
Um, and, um, and then there are a couple of private providers that we use um, in particular, you know, for particular training related to literacy um, and looking at, from my lens, looking at, at children who have um, present with characteristic, characteristics of dyslexia. So we really want to make sure that in particular, special educators are deeply trained in understanding the cognitive profile of those learners and the intervention that, again, sort of marries well with what kids are getting in the gen ed classroom, but then takes it to a deeper level and um, with a lens of understanding that particular population. We also try really hard to build internal capacity. So, um, cause we wanna sustain the initiative. So, so that's important that we're empowering teachers to continue with the professional development so they can then become the trainer. Um, so that's part of our goal. You know, we approach it as one PD investment and then how do we continue to build that within our own um, supervisory union? And isn't that gonna be the thing that's gonna keep it going? Yes, teacher investment is the key to anything. And I think, you know, building principles come and go and when we, we just lost an incredible principal, um, but we had an internal um, plan and it continues to be great because the teachers are now invested in the success of the school, not just about central office or a principal. Now it's become part of the culture. So it's sustainable because um, they really believe in what they, and we celebrate small wins and big wins. And I think that's really important, but the idea of the teacher investment is what has really carried um, the success of this initiative. We're now in year seven. Um, so that's, really a, a great indicator for us that um, we are able to sustain beyond the building leader and the building leader that came in understands the importance of the initiative. How long did it take you and how much did it cost? <laughs> <laughs> I need to tally up um, how much it cost us. Um, it was uh, well over $100,000, but I would caveat by saying any CAN program that you buy is going to be that as well. So, and we had that experience when I arrived 12 years ago, that they had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in a canned basil program and it didn't do anything. So I, I just said, well, we're gonna invest in teachers. Um, that's what we're gonna, because I really believe in the MTS model. Um, and I think that universal instruction is going to get us far. Um, and that was where we invested. Um, we could, because there's just not enough um, interventionists or special educators to catch everybody up. Um, so we, we just approached it before the DMG report and that really confirmed our work um, that the investment in teachers has um, benefited all kids. Um, and it's also tripled our capacity to provide intervention without adding money to our budget. So fiscally, we had to be really responsible to our communities. And this model helped us um, not add personnel, um, but maximize personnel. Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks very much. It is always great to hear how um, something unfolds in the real world and on the ground and with the people who are actually doing it. So thanks a lot for your testimony uh, regarding that. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is um, uh, you had to join cultures when you merged and how that, how you sort of brought one to the other. Um, and then the other one is just, uh, you know, you took this on at a time, um, at a normal time. Uh, and our hope is that there will be equal enthusiasm this fall for a similar thing, but, but there's a lot going on with, with COVID recovery. And I, I'd like your thoughts on if you think it can be pulled off this fall as well. So culture change as you merged, uh, and then whether COVID could derail attempts to sort of get this kind of model into place. Um, I think that the culture change um, is, is always challenging. I think part of it was coming together to reestablish outcomes for kids. So that was some of the early work so that we were clear about what we wanted students to know and be able to do. So that from an SU perspective, that when we merged, we had to you know, join our documents and then create new ones. So to get teacher investment, um, but the, the training was, they were able to share experiences um, from one side to the other and then Teachers were really excited to, to learn more about it. So it was a, it was a lot of collaboration and, they, and it eventually followed um, the same path. So um, 
the, the merger helped us strengthen the numbers of our resources, but also provide support for teachers who were just new at it. So we, now we've got an internal support system um, through the merger. And yeah. then can we, can we do this in COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think professional development providers have gotten really creative about online learning. Um, so some of our teachers were trained through um, virtual and we have embedded coaching still happening within the school. So it did, COVID didn't prevent us from moving forward. So when we had new teachers hired, they went to the training last summer and the internal coaches, because it's a contracted service, are able to be in our school. So I don't think it, can, it will get in the way um, of a professional development plan. I, I meant more just in terms of people's capacity to sort of take it on. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's that readiness piece. So I think where can your teachers take on one more thing? I think it's dependent on the school. Um, you know, we're really mindful of that as we plan for next year, because I do think the social emotional needs of both adults and, and kids are going to be still something that we need to focus on. Um, so yeah, that's a great, it's my, to be mindful of that is absolutely essential. But I think like we've said earlier, tying it to, and, and, and you have in your bill, tying it to the DMG Act 173 and MTSS. And, and in particular MTSS, so that, that it's not seen as one more thing, but it's more of um, support for the work that, that's already happening. And I mean, earlier today, Michaela and I were on a call with our school psychologist. You know, we we're just trying to anticipate the needs of our data teams of our, um, you know, as kids are returning to school, having lost so much time and parents who are feeling pretty anxious about that, you know, how do we respond? So I think uh, yes, we have to be mindful of, of all the needs that are coming post COVID and maybe it's uh, more critical now than ever that, that we focus um, efforts around the literacy needs of our kids. This is also where we have federal funds coming in to use this. System. Yeah, I mean, schools are gonna be inundated with funds, right? So it's, and then it's gonna really be helping uh, figure out how do you prioritize um, and create systems that will sustain once the money is gone, too. So um, we hear that Title I funds are not being used. Are you also sending Title I funds back? This was a kind of a sad thing to hear that we're already sending federal dollars back. I think um, it, wow. the, the Title I funding, it, it gets, one of the things that we were trying not to do through our budgetary lens is continue to add positions that we couldn't sustain. So I think, um, I, I think it's, it's an interesting problem to have, which we do, um, because we don't need as much support. So when you, when you don't need as much support, it's, it's, we don't wanna continually add things that we locally couldn't sustain if federal funds went away. So it's, it's been a weird time to do that. Um, you know, I think it's, it's getting creative about how you use it through your summer programming, after school programming for tutoring um, and getting materials for, for teachers um, and professional development. I've leveraged Title I funds a lot for professional development um, because we have our internal um, systems for um, intervention. Um, so we don't wanna use it for personnel um, if it's just another add-on. Uh, I think too is the culture of um, sending a student away is something that we've broken is that it, it's our problem we've gone from a me culture to a we culture so that everyone is invested in the success of kids um, and that's because we've really emphasized um, the classroom teacher being collaborative with a special educator or an interventionist um, so that's the, the the we don't have one person designated for intervention because we believe that classroom teachers teaching and also providing intervention is the best um, support for kids. Um, and it also keeps them within the classroom setting. Um, so we don't have those positions designated as 1.0 interventionist parts. Are there questions, comments? Okay, so we are trying to not uh, invent something new. We're trying to use some of the structures that we have in this bill um, and uh, appreciate uh, your input. I appreciate hearing that here is an example of success. 
Um, I'm afraid I was distracted a minute when you were talking about the, the merger in, in terms of bringing the folks together. Um, that Are they all now at this point using the same yeah. leadership and same? Yeah. So yeah, that was a two year process. It was, yeah, definitely a process. And there was um, maybe a little of kicking and screaming, but um, but I think once, um, like Michaela said, the um, the resources are expanded, and and we have non-negotiables. You know, there are there are criteria that that from central office we expect that that how buildings operate, but we also each building and their population is unique, so there's autonomy as well for for how they um, operate within sort of the system that says, you know, these are the things that must be in place, data-driven decisions, you know, those, the universal curriculum, those kinds of things. And you are not a forced merger? No. 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 Okay. So were you an, an early merger? Oh, yeah, it, it feels so long ago, because um, <laughs> it was such a long process. So we merged in 2018. So it was, you know, I think in the, in the middle, probably. We yeah. weren't one of the first, but we were one in the middle. And it was, it was a very um, positive um, merger as far as the, th the three, uh, six communities come together. And here you are with uh, rising outcomes. Yes. Yeah. When we read the DMG, it was like, yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we do. Um, and we learned a lot from that as well. And, uh, and the work doesn't end, but it's, uh, the system, the, the leadership team and the systems of support are what are critical. And then the teacher professional development. And, and again, what I think is unique here is the content specialty model that goes down to grade one. So we have, you know, in classroom teachers, deep training in both literacy and math because they're focused on one of those subject areas. Um, and uh, the, um, the universal approach that is, that's built on science, right? There, that the teacher is the teaching manual, right? There is not a, a curriculum, a canned program that, that they deliver. They possess the knowledge that then they're able to individualize that for kids, depending on what they, what the student needs. And you have, you have as part of your comprehensive assessment, you, you have screening currently. Yes. And you have benchmark assessments. So yeah. you already with a trained staff can identify a student who's struggling because of a certain dyslexia or um, other yeah. you know, cognitive weaknesses. Um, you can identify, uh, you, you can identify what seems to be holding this, this child back and what to do about it. Right. And, apply the right kind of the continued work is really looking at what I consider talk about like tipping points at yeah. what point after we've been delivering intervention um, and students aren't making the progress we expect at what point you know that that point then what targeted assessments are we doing to get a, a better understanding of why they're struggling why they aren't making progress and then adjusting um, and sometimes that's meant we're going to adjust the provider we're going to we're going to leave this person and go to this person because we, you know, we know that they have the skill set that's necessary. Right. So move up the tier ladder. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> excuse me. This is, um, we've needed a little good news. Oh. <laughs> so I think the committee is happy to hear a little good news. Um, uh, excuse me, also that seems to be aligning with the recommendations of DMG, which this committee has taken a great interest in, um, with the census-based funding block grants around the corner, should be able to give you the flexibility um, in your funding to, to implement the model that you're, that you're doing. We do have a waiting study that we're looking at. Um, and, and we're working on how we're going to be working with that, I guess is what I would say. Um, some, some thoughtful implementation. Great. And happy to hear from you on that. I think with that, I'm going to give the committee a break. Um,
and we have the people in the room. So it's going to be Blanche Podolsky and Jenna Osmond, right? So, um, and then we have um, Superintendent uh, Libby Bonesteel and the, um, the Super uh, Superintendent's Association. They cannot come until three. Um, shall, we, shall we just come back at one, everybody? Sound good? Everybody go take a little walk. Thank you for the opportunity to share our story. Thank you. We, we appreciate it. So if we're going to go off and we'll, we'll just put up our, we'll, we'll stop here and um, come.